Dear friends, let's look at Luke chapter 11. We'll be walking through verses 14 through 23 this morning. A very um, interesting passage. Let's go ahead and begin there in verse 14. It says, Now he was casting out a demon that was mute, and when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, He cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan is also divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. There was a time in my uh, early 20s that I was around this group of evangelistic charismatics, and they were evangelistic not in the normal way of evangelism that you would think of. They weren't evangelistic seeking to share the law of God with others and bring people to an understanding of the way in which they fall short, and then sharing them the grace that is provided in Christ Jesus for all who will repent and trust on Him, but rather they participated in what they called Holy Spirit evangelism. There are a great many charismatics that I've run into over the years that practice what they call Holy Spirit evangelism. They will say, well, it's good that you're a Baptist and you've come to faith in Christ Jesus and you're going to heaven, but we need to tell you now about this second blessing that you need to receive. You need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Or some would say, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And they would go back and forth uh, on which term they might use. And they would walk around these groups on the college campus, and they would seek to find Christians coming from evangelical churches, many of which were, were nominal in their teaching, not in depth with their teaching. And so they could show them a few passages And they could lead the people to be a bit confused. Well, these Roman soldiers fell down here. That must have been the Holy Spirit filling them, as the charismatics say. And you have John falling down here at the the beginning of the book of Revelation. And so that must be what you see going on at like the uh, Benny Hinn revival rallies where people are falling down and they're shaking and they're twisting upon the ground as people are hitting them and yelling at them and slapping them with coats and jackets and other things like that. And I was around this group, and I became curious with them and began to interact with them, began to realize that I was not well-grounded in this theology. I was not well-grounded even in many of the passages of Scripture that they were using. I grew up in a church, and many times the pastor would just talk about whatever he felt like talking about that week. And so you would go from passage to passage, context to context, and I didn't have a good, solid understanding of many of these we could say more difficult passages in the Bible, ones that didn't preach this nice, clean, encouraging message that the people could walk away with that week. And so I was ignorant in some of these areas. But as I began to interact with them and began to see how they were working and began to see how they would almost work people up into a fit and they would fall upon the ground, they would quickly run over after this 30-minute prayer session of repetition over them and they'd try to catch them before they fell why are you doing that? Why are you trying to catch them? from? Fall? Well, they might hit their head. Why are they going to hit their head? Well, they're full of the Spirit of God. The, the Spirit of God has filled them, and they're falling down. And you've got to keep them from hitting their head. That's what the Spirit of God is doing. Then the young women that were wearing skirts or dresses, they'd run over and try to preserve modesty. And I said, this is the Spirit of God that is doing this behavior. We sat around at one of these rallies one day. It was a man who was deceased at this point. His name was Steve Hill. And we were sitting around, and people were flopping this way and that way. And there was yelling, and there was hollering. And I don't know why you have to yell 
doing this. I don't know why you have to yell in the microphone. I don't know why when there's someone that supposedly has a demon, you have to yell at the demons. I don't know if they don't hear well. There was a man that was there. His name was Andre Bassani. He's kind of a Benny Hinn of Latin America at this point. He's really made it up through the ranks at this time. And he was one that I was engaging with on this. And I said, you know, this does not look like Christianity. His strong Argentinian accent, he began, to say, he began to tell me, you need to be very careful with what you're doing. I was like, look, this doesn't look like Christianity. Why would the Spirit of God want people to smash their heads on the ground? Why doesn't the Spirit of God, the Spirit filling you, you say they're filled with the Spirit, doesn't that result in the fruits of the Spirit? Isn't self-control one of these fruits? And he warned me. It's like, you are attributing the work of God to Satan. You are attributing the work of God to, to demons. He warned me that you're getting close to committing the unforgivable sin. Well, did I commit the unforgivable sin? Is that what happened when I called into question this behavior that I didn't see backed up in church history, didn't see backed up for sure within the Scriptures, didn't seem to make any reasonable sense? Well, I think you can, you can ponder that, and, and we will get to that passage shortly here in the book of Luke. But there are some people in this passage that accuse Jesus of doing something similar to what I said to him that day. This does not look Christian. This does not look like self-control. This does not look like something that glorifies God. We have Jesus in this passage performing a miracle as he performed many miracles. And they did they deny his miracles? They did not. Rather, they attributed them to Satan, or in this passage we'll see the term that is used is Beelzebul. So there's three things that we see within this passage. We see the vilification of Jesus, the vindication of Jesus, and the power of Jesus. We see self-righteous and evil men vilifying Jesus vilifying Jesus, calling what he does evil, calling his miracles satanic, declaring what he does is inconsistent with the work of God. And why? Why was it not good what happened? This man could not speak, and now he's speaking. Someone that was blind, and now they can see. No, he was not fitting within their religious system. He was not walking and speaking and acting as they did. But we see the vindication of Jesus, one who is vindicated by his works, one who is vindicated as one who is prophesied, one who is declared, who would come forward, who would perform these miracles that he is doing, that people that are blind will be able to see. People that cannot speak will be able to speak. People that are, that are injured, people that are disabled, people that are maimed in some way will be healed this is pointing to his power. This is pointing to that he is the one that was prophesied to come, that long-awaited king, that long-awaited ruler, that Lord of David. Thirdly, we see the power of Jesus Christ, power that is demonstrated, his vindication and his power that is shown, and that power that is shown through Christ Jesus is the power that raised him from the dead and that power is even within you, dear Christian, not to go and do whatever Jesus did at any point. That's not, the, that's not where this sermon is going. Not, not to give you the ability just to raise people from the dead or to, to yell at demons and cause them to respond to, to, to what it is that, that you tell them to do, but rather to give you victory over sin. That which he is doing physically for the people here does point to what will ultimately happen physically at the resurrection. But in a very particular important, important way, it points to what is happening to them spiritually. You can look at each of the miracles that he does, and they point to what God is doing for someone spiritually. There is damage that has happened in humanity because of the fall and the work of God is coming forward here through the work of Jesus Christ. And this is the, the beginning of that. This is the kingdom of God coming forward. 
this effect it has upon the people. So let's look at the, the vilification of Jesus. Let's look there in Luke 11 and verses 14 through 16. Now, he was casting out a demon that was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others to test him kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. There's much that is fascinating here within even this short little passage that we have. Um, we, we have here this, this statement that the demon was mute. It, we're not, it was the man unable to speak because of the demon, or was the demon unable to speak? And that's why the man couldn't speak. It's not entirely clear, but there was a demon possessing this man. And the demon that possessed, since the demon possessed this man, this man was not able to speak as he should. Your tongue is something that is a blessing from the Lord. Your tongue is something that is a spiritual barometer. A man who cannot control his tongue lacks self-control. A man who cannot control his tongue lacks wisdom. You see that over and over as you look through the Proverbs. And the solution there isn't just to say, okay, well, I'm not controlling my tongue, so I'm going to work harder at controlling my tongue. Yes, you should, you should do that. But it is evidence of a spiritual condition. It is evidence of a spiritual problem. The inability to control what you say is very much connected even to what you do. Learning to control what you say is connected to learning to control what you do. James gives us this understanding. I won't read the whole passage, but that idea is very much contained there in James chapter 3. But James 3, 5 and 6 says, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And a tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. You were given your tongue, you were given the ability to speak for the purpose of glorifying God. Have you thought about that? Have you thought about that? Each, each and every one of the miracles that happens, the people that are healed, they're given sight, they're given the ability to move, they're given understanding. Each of these things, it's putting back in order what was put out of order because of the fall. And this is manifesting itself in a physical way here, but in a spiritual way, they're not operating as they should either. And Jesus is physically healing this man, but the work of God within your life We'll deal with these things in a spiritual way that will influence you physically. will influence you in what you do and the choices that you make. And this demon was removed. This demon is exercised, is removed by the power of Christ. And this man is now able to speak. He's able to speak for the glory of God. He's able to speak because God had made him for that purpose. God had given him a tongue whereby he could speak and God could be Glorify, that's the purpose of your tongue. That's the purpose of your ability to speak, that you would use it in a way that glorifies God. However, those that are watching this miracle, those that are watching what Jesus does, begin to speak in ways that are ungodly. They begin to use their tongues in ways that are ungodly. They begin to show themselves to be spiritually mute, to show themselves to be unable to speak that which is true and right. They should have glorified God when this man was healed. They should have celebrated. Notice this, and I want to emphasize this very importantly, because there's many that will say, well, there's no evidence that Jesus, some will be crazy enough to say Jesus never existed, which is completely absurd. The, the world is completely different because of the incarnation of Christ Jesus, because Jesus existed. There is a calendar that is completely different because Jesus came into this world. But it's a couple years off. I know it's a couple years off, but the fact is that it was changed in the West completely because Christ came. To say he never came is absurd in the highest order. But I want you to see this in regard to his miracles. People say, well, I don't see any evidence of God. If God is here, he should do a miracle in front of me. And if he'll just do a miracle in front of me, then I will believe him. I've spoken to so many people that will make such a confession. If God would just come before me right now and do a miracle, then I would believe. Really? 
Is that your final answer? Are you sure that's what is going to happen? Because look what happens within this passage. The enemies of Jesus don't deny his miracles. Instead, they attribute them to Satan. They give another explanation as to why it is that they are happening. Why? Because Christ is coming forward declaring the law to people, and they don't like the standard of the law that he is putting forward. They want a law that is lower. They want a law that they are comfortable with. They want a law that tells them, I'm a good boy, and I've made the standard. There's these others that haven't, but look at what I have done. Look at the merit that I have earned. Jesus is putting forward the law in such a heavy way that nobody listening is able to say, I'm good, I got it. I always glorify God with all of my thoughts, with all of my desires, with all of my deeds. In every way, I've always done it. No, Jesus preaches through the Sermon on the Mount, and people are listening, and they're realizing that they don't meet this standard. This is offensive to the legalist. Does that make sense? Are you surprised when I say that? When I say it is offensive to the legalist that the law is being proclaimed, that the reality and the depth of the law is being proclaimed, it is offensive to the legalist? You say the legalist, they just care about the law. Wouldn't the legalist be saying, yes, that's what I want to hear? No, the legalist has created his own standard of the law. The legalist has lowered the standard of the law. The law. I know I mentioned this before, but I, I debated a, a bishop in the Methodist church, and he was arguing for the doctrine of perfectionism. He was arguing for the doctrine of perfectionism, that you as a Christian can come to a place where you live perfect, where you live a perfect life. And I began to continue with him. I began to press upon him. I said, sir, you're being a legalist. Sir, you're being an antinomian antinomian, without law. How can you say I'm being without law? How can you say that I am, I want people to keep the law? No, no, you're lowering the standard. He began by saying, look, I don't mean that people would be perfect in everything they desire and everything they think, but just with their outward actions. That's not the law that Jesus preaches. And these men were legalists, women too, but they were legalists. They thought they could keep this, this standard. And that is why they saw the works that he did. And they said, this man can't be from God because he's not keeping the religion that we so desire. Garland makes this point. He says, Jesus' opponents do not dismiss his exorcisms as some kind of a hoax, but perversely attribute them to the forces of evil, not God. These muckrakers are not identified, but the Pharisees and the lawyers who are condemned in the next section are most likely the candidates. We see that in Matthew 12 and Mark 3. Jesus' inroads with the crowds threaten them the most, but they have been the most vocal in opposing Jesus. By not identifying these opponents specifically, however, Luke does not limit this to the evil generation, but to one small party in Judaism. So it's, it's even the leadership that is saying this it is the people as a whole that are participating in this. We can't just look at the people participating as victims or just victims of these leadership. In some ways they are, but also they are participating. This charge is f further evidence. This idea that Jesus performed miracles is, is, is further evidence in the fact that Jesus' followers would not have created a charge like this against Jesus. They wouldn't have said, well, Jesus was doing this, and then they're attributing it to Satan. That's absurd. There's also evidence in other writings. Josephus makes this argument. He's a first century historian that lived, um, was born around the time when Christ began his ministry, somewhere around there. Um, I think he died 70 or 80 AD. And he says this, now there was a time, there was, now there was about this time, Jesus, a wise man, for he was a doer of startling deeds. And you may hear that and you might think, well, that's, it doesn't mean he did miracles doesn't mean that he believed that's what he did. Um, but the startling deeds is the same term that he uses in his writings for the miracles that were done by Elijah. So that's the term that he's using. He's trying to be, he wasn't a follower of Christ, but he's trying to be balanced as a historian and just say, this is what was believed. This was the belief of the day is that the man was doing miracles. Whether you believe in him or not is, is another question. You have antagonists and skeptics here. Like the man who will stand there and say, if only God would show me a sign, if only God would do some miracle in front of me right now, then I would believe. But what does man do whenever he sees a sign? 
What does he do when something is shown to him? What would he do? He would dismiss it. He would come up with a reason as to why it happened. Perhaps I wasn't seeing things right. Perhaps I was uh, hallucinating, all right? Which is what you would have to have with the amount of people at this time that claimed Jesus did what he did. You would have to have this mass hallucination, not just one or two people, but, a, but hundreds and, and even thousands of people would have to make these declarations Another commentator named Edward says this as well. He says, people often imagine they would believe in Jesus if they saw his miracles, but this text is evidence that undisputed miracles do not necessarily evoke faith. Other bystanders desire to see a corroborating sign from heaven, from Jesus. The demand for a sign would seem less antagonistic than the accusation that Jesus is in league with Beelzebul, but in the context, it is no less offensive. Jesus is doing this, and they say, okay, that's nice. Why don't you do something else? Like those in John 6 that saw a miracle. Okay, well, well, do another miracle for me. Let me see something else. What did you see in Egypt? Did they all just believe because there were great miracles that were done? No. They became more hardened in their understanding, more hardened in their hearts. J.C. Ryle says this, it is always one mark of a thoroughly unbelieving heart to pretend to want more evidence of the truth of religion. There is sufficient evidence all around us of God's existence. Romans 1 declares this overwhelmingly. There's evidence of God's existence in all that has been made. There's evidence of God's law in all that has been made. You don't even need the Bible to tell you the law of God. How can you say that, Pastor? You don't need the Bible to tell you that it is sinful to steal from someone. You don't need the Bible to tell you that it is sinful to lie. We talked about that ninth commandment. It's in the Bible. It's a part of God's law. But you know very well that you should not lie, that you should not steal. You don't want someone to treat you that way. It's evident all around you. And so this evidence around you condemns you. That's what we have. We have general revelation gives enough information and knowledge about God to all people everywhere to condemn them to condemn them in their lack of obedience to God. But is there sufficient evidence in the creation? Can I look around the creation and see God's redemptive plan? Can I look to the stars and the moon and the planets? Can I look to the trees and the canyons and see God's redemptive purpose and plan? You cannot. You need special revelation for that. You need the message of the Scriptures. You need God's redemptive plan in the gospel of Jesus Christ whereby you can be saved. These men went forward to vilify Jesus, and these men went forward for the purpose of condemning them, but their words condemned themselves, for they had sufficient evidence around them of who God was and what God was doing through Jesus, and they had sufficient evidence as well that Christ was justified in what He was doing. And we see His vindication in this next portion. It says here in um, Luke eleven seventeen through 19, it says, But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan is also divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. Now, we have this term that has been used oftentimes here, Beelzebul, and there's, they're not, there's, we're not precisely sure exactly what it means. Some say, well, it's, 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 the, it's the chief demon. He's the demon over all of the other demons. There have actually seen books where people wrote all kinds of incredible things about uh, this guy, Beelzebul, that was Satan's right-hand man and all the things that he did as a demon, things that we don't have privy to us within uh, the Scriptures and that we don't really need to be seeking out anyway. But with, it's, it's the idea of basically, um, the, it came from most likely a Canaanite god, and the Jews would sometimes take words and say something similar to them to say something else. And so you have either Beelzebul or Beelzebulb, and the one means Lord of the Flies, there's a book named after that term, and the other means Lord of the Dung, all right? And so either way, it's communicating the, the same idea. That's, that's the seriousness of what they're saying to Jesus here. That's the, the understanding, that's the Jewish terms that sound like 
what they're saying to him. That's who they are attributing, okay? The Lord of the dung or the Lord of the flies. And you know where flies fly around. So it's the same idea being communicated either way. And Jesus responds by this by saying, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste in a divided household falls. And he's not making an argument here that Satan's kingdom is going to in some way stand, but rather he's arguing here that this doesn't make any sense. Why would Satan do this? This is a line that is quoted by Abraham Lincoln, um, uh, I think right bef- either right before the Civil War or in the middle of it. He says, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, a divided household falls. And so he, even there's a historical context that we see this idea of a, a, a country or a kingdom divided against itself is going to self-destruct. It's going to fall apart. And the question here is, is why would a ruler of a kingdom intentionally erode at that kingdom? Why would a ruler of a kingdom intentionally damage or destroy a portion of the kingdom? And that's, that's what he's asking there. That's, that's what he's saying here. The, the mere fact that Jesus and the apostles are exercising these demons is evidence that God is at work, that God is doing this, okay? It is Satan that was sending demons into the people to, to damage them, to destroy them, to harm them spiritually. Why would Satan attack his own minion? That's the logic that is here. What sense does it make for Satan to be destroying a work that's working just fine? Everything is going just fine here for him. Exercising demons is the very opposite of what Satan does, it was a good thing for this man who had the demon removed from him. It was a blessing for him that this happened. You have this phrase that is here, which in verse 19, it says, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. And this could be applied to the disciples of Christ that are casting out demons. This could also possibly be referring to Jews during that time that claim to have the power to exercise demons, and he's, he's saying, well, these are your, your, your people, and they're doing this as well. How are they doing it? They're doing the same thing that I'm doing. We're not really sure. I've read quite a bit on it, and I'm not really sure which one of those that it is, and I don't think it really matters. The point here is that they are being hypocritical. He is calling them out for making a claim that is illogical. It doesn't make any sense what they are saying, and he's telling them that they are being hypocritical. And that's the reality of all who are denying Christ. All who are denying Christ are living in some type of hypocrisy. They're taking the law of God and they're diminishing in some way. Each and every religion in the world does this other than Christianity. Each and every religion in the world diminishes the law of God in some way and then tells man he is keeping it in some way to make himself right before God. That's inconsistent. That's not what you can do. You see this even happen in Matthew 11, 18 and 19. For John came neither eating or drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man comes eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a man, a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But Jesus says this, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. The works of Christ are what justified him, not in a legal sense, but what gave evidence that he is who he said he was. He is coming forward. The kingdom of God is coming forward. That's where we will be in the next point. But there's the kingdom of God is coming forward. The forces of Satan are being destroyed. The effects of the fall and of sin are being removed. Christ is working here. It's evident that he is who he said he is. Jesus is unlike all of these leaders of false religions. Jesus is unlike All of these various cult leaders who have come around, all of these various cult leaders that come around, it's almost the same, same story. I'm about to debate um, next month. A friend of mine and I are debating a man who is claiming to be a leader of a modern Manichaean group and studying this man, Manny, that that came around back in the um, third and fourth century during that time. Uh, He is a man who did just that, just like Muhammad did, just like Joseph Smith did later on in the 19th century. He's the man that came around and said, look, everyone's wrong. Everything's incorrect here. 
I've gotten a vision from God. The man went so far as to claim to be the paraclete that was promised by Jesus. He said, everyone else is wrong. I've got a message that is here, and here it is. Dismiss what's come before me. It's been corrupted. It's been damaged. This is the new message that you need to hear. And that's the case with so many of these cult leaders. They come forward out of the clear blue, and they just testify of themselves. They, they just speak of themselves. Now, the Son of God, the one who brought all things into existence from absolutely nothing, that's what John says at the beginning of his gospel, that Christ is the one who brought all things into existence from absolutely nothing. He is one who clothed himself in flesh and came to out, dwelt amongst us, and he did not come merely speaking of himself. He came as one who was testified from those that came before him. Early on in the Scriptures, right after the fall, we have the promise. The Lord is going to send one that will crush the head of the serpent. The child of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. That promise is there, and it is given right at the fall, and that promise is fulfilled at the incarnation when Christ comes forward, born of Mary, born in Bethlehem, the one who was promised this long-awaited king, and he did not just speak of himself. You have the writers of the Gospels speaking over and over and over of that which was declared about him, that which he would be. You even have the signs that he does that are declaring who he is. The prophets that came before said these are the things that would happen when the Messiah came. And you see those happening, which is happening right here. He is distinct from every other religion. And there we see the, the power of Christ, the power of Christ as it, it is going forward, as he is waging war against Satan and his kingdom. He is waging war against Satan and his, his minions. We see the power of Christ there in verses 20 through 22. He says, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come among you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when a stronger, when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. This is one of those many misinterpreted passages, those that are just get run off with those in the Word of Faith movement and, and, and many charismatics and those that look at this as, as some kind of a recipe on how it is that I'm going to deal with demons or deal with different kinds of sins that, that people are dealing with. And you'll see this uh, taught in some of these books, this idea that, okay, you need to go and you need to deal with the strong man and you need to bind the strong man and then binding the strong man and then you're dealing with the lower one here and, and someone, someone, someone will be teaching on that. They'll say, well, someone's struggling with the sin. Have you, have you bound the strong man yet? which apparently happens by you just declaring that the strong man would be bound, and then this demon is bound, and now you can deal with this underling demon in some way that you didn't have the ability to do because you hadn't dealt with this strong man uh, that was up here. And then the question just comes about, you're, who's letting them go? Are they just bound for a little bit? Are you holding on to them for now? Or what, who's letting them go? What, what is happening here? That's not how we need to understand this passage or some of the others like this. This is a passage where Christ is talking about He being the one that is the stronger one, and He being the one who is, is taking control. He being the one that is dealing with these demonic forces and is defeating them and is overpowering them. He is teaching who He is. This passage is not a recipe on what you go off and do, but a, a declaration of who Christ is and what Christ is doing. And you can remember that Christ is all-powerful. Christ has defeated sin and death through His life and death and His resurrection. And regardless of what you are experiencing, what you are going through, regardless of difficulty you may be walking through, even spiritual battles, Christ is stronger. Christ is greater than all of your sin, and there is power in Christ. We must trust in Christ. We must lean upon Him. We must cling to Him because these, these miracles that He did were a declaration that the kingdom of God had come. 
those that were there in the first century, you've heard this many times and you understand this, they were looking for a political reality. Praise God when politics change and things go a positive direction, but the Spirit of God works when things are going well politically for the people of God, and the Spirit of God works when things aren't going well for the people of God, and many times when things aren't going well for the people of God, it is a time where He is doing something very important for His people. We had the gospel spread throughout Asia in the first century because of political turmoil that they had. We had what we call these diasporas. There's multiple diasporas that happened. There would be a persecution here, and they would scatter these Christians. You know, it was like these, these sailors one time that were having this problem with these starfish, and they grabbed the starfish, they caught the starfish, and they said, you know what we're going to do with these starfish? We're going we're to cut them up. So they'd cut up these starfish, but the starfish would regenerate parts of their body, um, even, even though they were so, they were basically reproducing these starfish by cutting them up, and they made their situation even worse. They reproduced so many starfish because they were chopping them up and cutting them up and throwing them back in the water. And so it is with those that thought they would, they would, they would, they would remove, they would extinguish Christianity by persecuting the Christians. They persecuted them, and they moved, and they were sent out, and they spread Christianity to these new places. The Word of God began to go because the Christians that were comfortable where they were weren't trying to sell their house and go somewhere else and leave their jobs and go another place. But the Lord, the Lord uh, sent this persecution, not directly, but we can understand He was sovereign over what was happening here, just as He was sovereign over Christ and His death, as He's sovereign over all that happens. And they were sent, and God had a purpose in that, that new Christians came into being. New people came to faith in Christ Jesus. New churches were planted. And this work that we see here in this passage is, is the work of God. The kingdom of God has arrived. They didn't like this. This isn't what they wanted to see. They wanted to see a victorious king that would come forward on a horse and defeat the Romans, chop them down. It's not what the Lord sent. The Lord sent one who would deal with their greatest problem, who would deal with their greatest need. And that was their relationship with God. That was the way in which sin had affected their life. That they who had a mouth were not using it in a way that glorified God. They had arms and legs and a mind. I, they were not using it in a way that glorified God because of the effects of sin. But Christ came that they could have victory over sin, that they could be healed, that they could glorify God. And that is the evidence that is here. He says, this is done by the finger of God. Finger of God, that's an interesting term, and that goes back to the, New, the Old Testament. And we see that in two places in particular. We see the finger of God declared with the miracles that happened in Egypt, and secondly, we see the finger of God declared in regard to the creation of the tablets upon which the Ten Commandments were written. And so it's, this is pointing back to that. That's what this terminology is doing. The Egyptian magicians there in Exodus 8 and verse 19, then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Again, if I just saw a miracle, then I would believe. A apparently not, because Pharaoh saw more miracles than anyone else in history. Uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, Exodus 31 and verse 18, and he, gave, and he gave to Moses when he had finished speaking to him with him on Mount Sinai two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Again, Deuteronomy 9 and verse 10, and he gave me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on it were all the words that the Lord had spoken with you on the mountain out of the midst of the fire on the day of assembly. And if you remember, it was the time where they said, we don't want to listen to Moses, we just want to hear God speak. And they got to hear God speak. And God declared to them the Ten Commandments. And the ground was shaking as He was speaking. And they were terrified at that point because God was declaring His law to them. And they saw the ways in which they fell short. And they said, okay, Moses, you can, you can be our mediator at that point. And that should be a reminder to you, dear friend, that you need a mediator. Don't tell yourself, I'm good, I'll just stand before the Lord. I'll just tell the Lord what it is. I'll just tell the Lord that there wasn't enough evidence for me to believe. No, you will stand before the Lord without a mediator, without anyone to speak on your behalf, and you will stand condemned 
If that is what you choose, if that is what you do, you will stand condemned before the Lord. You will not lay out a diatribe. You will not list out an argument as to why you are right and God is wrong and why you are justified in sinning and living your life as you did and God is wrong for not sending you enough evidence. No, you will stand condemned. You will bow on your knees. You will declare Jesus is Lord, but you will stand condemned and you will have no mediator. Christ has come that you can have a mediator, dear friends, that you don't have to stand before the Lord and be judged for your sins. Christ's blood is sufficient for all who will come to him, all who will trust upon him. Notice what he's doing here. Notice what Jesus is doing here when he talks about the finger of God. He is placing the Jews and their leadership in the same category as the unbelieving Egyptians. The unbelieving Egyptians, the, 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 the unbelieving uh, Egyptian leadership, Pharaoh and the others, that though these miracles were performed, they continued in their unbelief. You say, well, they didn't have a choice. They, they, no, there are Egyptians that believed. There are Egyptians that left with the Israelites when they went out. There was a mixed multitude. You'll see that at that point in Exodus. There's a mixed multitude that went out with them in the Exodus from Egypt. It was Egyptians that said, we need to follow that God. I don't know where they're going, but I'm going to follow this God because this is the true God. This Jewish leadership and these others that are following them are in the same category of the unbelieving Egyptians. And notice as well, the finger of God is pointing to their violation of the law of God. These miracles point to God's holiness these miracles are a reminder that you will give an account of how you live your life. You see Paul giving that, that, that argument. Paul giving that argument. Where he says Christ's resurrection is evidence that there's going to be a judgment to come. The miracle of Christ's resurrection is evidence that you will give an account to God. It's evidence that He is God and He will judge. People aren't saved because they see miracles. So one person can see a miracle and it will result in them believing. Another person can see a miracle and they will be hardened in their unbelief. Remember, Peter saw the miracle of the great catch. He saw that great miracle at that time. He said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. This was evidence that the kingdom of God had come among them. It was evidence that God was working amongst the people, that Jesus was who he says he is, that Jesus is who was prophesied. Okay, he's not a mere moral teacher. He doesn't give you that option. So many will try to see him in that way. He's just a good, he's just a good man. He's just a nice man. He did all these things. We can learn to live like him, learn to be like him. Good men don't say they're God if they're not God. C.S. Lewis gave the argument there. You, you must accept him. He's either liar, he's either lunatic, or he is, he is Lord. Okay, he, 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 he's not, he can't have it, just he's a nice moral teacher. If he says he's God, if he says before, uh, before Abraham was, I am, if he's declaring himself to be the God who was, who was demonstrated there in the burning bush before Moses, the God that did all the miracles there in Egypt, and he's not, then he's either lying about it or he's crazy. And if he's crazy, you should not be worshiping and following him. That's not the person that you go to follow as a good moral teacher, someone who is crazy. That's not who you follow. Someone who is a liar, that's not a moral teacher that you should be following. That's not acceptable. He's not a good man if he's crazy or if he's lying. But if he is Lord, you must worship him as Lord. You must recognize who he is. That's what he's emphasizing here. If the kingdom of God has come, if this is evidence of the finger of God, then there's a response that you must give. Jesus is not just a moral teacher, right? He is a military warrior, not in an earthly sense. I'm trying to storm the capital with this. But in a, in a spiritual sense, he is attacking the powers that be. He is destroying the work of Satan. That is what he is doing. Colossians 2, verses 13 through 15. And you who were dead in your trespasses 
and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame, triumphing over them. Let me continue. Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same thing, that through his death he might destroy the one who has power, the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Jesus is this greater Moses that is freeing the people from slavery. Just as Moses led the people out of Egypt and broke the shackles of Pharaoh over them, Christ has led his people out of slavery to sin that they can go forward and worship God. 1 John 3 and verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And that is what Christ is doing here in this miracle. He is destroying the works of the devil. The kingdom of God has come forward, and that is evidenced. We have this statement there in verse 23 of Luke 11. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. You've got two options. You've got two places in which you can reside. You are either one who is with Christ or you are one who is against Christ. You are the one who is gathering with Christ or you are one who is scattering the very opposite. Gathering is the very opposite of scattering. What do we mean gathering and scattering? It is the very opposite of what God is doing. God is calling his people to himself. He is bringing his people in. We see this in multiple places in the Old Testament. Let me list just a couple. Isaiah 11 and and verse 12. He will raise up a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Again, you see it in Isaiah 40 and verse 11. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. We see this many other places that I could cite as well. He's saying there are but two choices here. You're either with Christ or you are against Christ. This is, this is the picture that we have in the Scriptures. You're either in the light or you're in the darkness. You see that throughout John's epistles. You're either one place or the other. You're not in the middle ground. There's not a a middle place where you can stand. There's two places that you can be in spiritually, one or the other. You're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. You're either alive in Christ or you are dead. One or the other. You either see or you are blind. You You have two choices. And the question that I have for you is where do you stand, dear friends? Are you, are you a child of God? Are you one who has been changed? Are you telling yourself, I'm just going to keep doing better. I'm going to keep working harder. I'm going to make this change, that change. Well, we've got a passage coming forward shortly that's going to address that idea and that concept. I think it's, it's dealing with a rather the group here, but I think we could apply it to the individual as well that seeks this moralism of existence, that seeks this Um, you know, justifying himself through his own actions. Where do you stand? Have you seen your need of Christ? Have you seen the way in which you have broken God's law? And has it led you not to say, how can someone say that? That person is so judgmental. Has it led you to say, I've fallen short. I I am in dire straits. Don't turn from that that conviction that you feel for breaking God's law. Don't justify it. Don't blame it on your circumstances. Don't blame it on your upbringing. Don't blame it on on, on where where you are in history. Don't blame it on technology. Don't blame it on this is how things are with kids nowadays. See, See the root of it. See the root of it. See the consequences of sin and how it is destructive to your life. How is destructive to those that you care for and those that you love? In turn, to the only means God has given, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. 
the one who has come to defeat the work of Satan, the one who has come that you can have life, that you can be changed. See that Christ has fulfilled the law in every way. He never broke it. See that Christ took upon himself the consequences of sin, took upon himself the fullness of the wrath of God, that there would be none left for you. There would be no work left for you to do for your justification. Pastor, are you saying it doesn't matter how we live? Absolutely it matters how you live. That's Ephesians 2 and verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. You are saved to do good works, but you're not saved because of your good works. They will not suffice. You need Christ. Oh, dear friend, don't leave here trusting in your own works. Don't leave here trusting in your own efforts. Don't leave here as one who is self-righteous. Don't leave here as one who diminishes God's law and claims to keep it and makes yourself a legalist that will not stand before the Lord. See what God has given. See what God has offered through Christ Jesus. See yourself as insufficient. See yourself as insufficient. See Christ as the one who is sufficient. Trust in Him and believe upon Him and you will be saved. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. It is through Christ alone that you can have salvation and that you can have peace with God. Come to Christ and Christ alone. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you. We are thankful for Christ and his blessing. We are thankful for Christ and his finished work. We are thankful that Christ has done all that is necessary whereby we can have peace with God We are thankful for the power that raised Christ from the dead dwells within each and every believer that we can have victory over sin. Father, I pray for all those that are under the sound of my voice that they would see the greatness of God's law, they would see the greatness of of how they have fallen short and they would trust in Christ, they would turn to Christ, they would believe upon Christ, they would have salvation in Christ Jesus. The just as this man who was the, who, who, was, who was given speech. He was no longer mute. He was able to speak. He was able to glorify God. The one that is saved would likewise glorify God in all ways. We pray this in Jesus' name.